Okay. Uh, hi. So today I, I am continuing the course uh, that Sylvain started yesterday. And I, in, in the two lectures of today, I will present some, some of uh, the battery of examples of partially hyperbolic dynamics we have. So in the, in the lecture notes, which are now in the, in the web page, there are more examples and more explain, explanations than, than the ones I, I have the time to give here. But let me just uh, tell a little bit about this. So, so let's start by recalling the, the two kinds of partial hyperbolicity that Silman defined yesterday. So on the one hand, we had globally partially hyperbolic diffuse, which were diffeomorphisms such that the whole tangent bundle splits Yeah, as, a, as an invariant, it has an invariant splitting where this bundle was contracted, this was expanded, and there was a domination between these bundles. And, and then there was another definition of a partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism, which only required this uh, splitting in the, in the set of points which were recurrent in a certain sense. So it was partially hyperbolic diffuse. This meant to be a diffeomorphism F, admitting a filtration that, that was what the, the chain recurrent classes. There were some trapping regions, right? A, a finite set of trapping regions such that. Each one of these sets was a trapping region, and the sets lambda i equal the maximal invariant set is partially hyperbolic set. Okay? So this meant that for this set, we had a splitting like this above this set. So the, these were two different kind of definitions. This one will be the one that we will be more interested in because it's more general. But today, in the first lecture, I will give examples of this particular class of partially hyperbolic systems. And in the second lecture, we will focus on, on this kind of examples. So uh, let me see if I have. Uh, uh, another remark is that, in general, we want to have these bundles, this center bundle, as smaller as possible. Because, in general, we have much better control of these bundles than, as, than of this one. So we will try to give examples and try to uh, provide the best kind of the compositions we can obtain. So today, we, uh, this morning, we will talk about globally partially hyperbolic examples. OK, and these ones are the harder uh, to obtain, because one expects that if you have a, a splitting like this of the tangent bundle, this will give some constraints on the topology of the manifold which admits uh, such, a, such an example. So yesterday, Sylvain gave a, a one uh, example of a result in this direction that was an os of diffeomorphisms, which were the ones that don't have a center bundle, for which this bundle has dimension one, only live in the torus. Okay, so th there are several restrictions to admit this kind of diffeomorphism. So before I give some example, let me tell you the, the only known, at least to me, ways or, to construct examples of globally partially hyperbolic system. So there are the first kind of, of examples, which are kind of the building blocks 
of uh, other examples are algebraic or geometric constructions. So these are kind of examples that come to partially hyperbolic dynamics from outside. Okay, so this is uh, the field called homogeneous dynamics. There will be a course on this next week. And this is by geometric reasons. Uh, I will try to explain a little bit about this. And then once you have these building blocks, you can make new examples out of the old ones. And there are essentially three ways I know to do this. One way is skew products. Okay, so let me give an example in each one. So this is an example that Sylvain gave uh, yesterday of an algebraic example. It's a matrix acting in RD that descends to the torus. A skew product will be another example that Syl Sylvain gave yesterday, which is this times the identity, for example. So if you have this, if you have a partially hyperbolic system already, then you can multiply it by the identity on some manifold and you get, again, a partially hyperbolic system. You are getting a, a higher dimensional center. Okay, so this kind of example I will explain in the afternoon because it's also useful for these kind of uh, things. And then there are two other mechanisms which we don't fully understand which are uh, surgery methods and here let me uh, say the, the, the keyword is an of flows and finally there is the another method which is kind of particular to partial hyperbolicity which is the deformation or composition which I'll try to explain at the end of the lecture. Okay, so as I said, none of these methods uh, has been exhausted. Uh, we, we still have questions in each of these methods, but I will try to give uh, some examples uh, on each of the classes. Not this one. I, this one I will speak in the, in the afternoon. So let's start by algebraic examples. And to start with, I will try to give a generalized version of this example. So consider A a matrix with integral coefficients and determinant equal to 1, and B, a vector in RD. Okay, so one can consider the following diffeomorphism of RD, which is FAB of X plus AX plus B. Okay, so notice that this, this is a diffeomorphism of RD. You can, you can compute F A B to the minus 1 equals F of A minus 1, A minus 1 B. Okay, this is uh, an exercise. And, and of course, since this matrix has determinant equal to 1, this is also an integer coefficient matrix. Okay? And so, as you compute what happens if you add an integer, you get that this is a x plus b plus n, and this So if this belongs to CD, this also belongs to CD. So if this, uh, 
diffeomorphism descends to a diffeomorphism of the torus. Okay, so one has F from TD. Induced my F AB. And notice that if if you look at this, the composition by eigenvalues of this matrix, so let's write. It's uh, the composition. It's like the short and the composition, but we are grouping in each bundle, all the eigenvalues of the same modulus. Okay. okay, so if if you apply the derivative, the derivative of this diffeomorphism, oh, notice. equal to the matrix A, and if this is the decomposition of this matrix, this will be an invariant decomposition by the derivative. Okay? And the fact that eigenvalues here are different in modulus implies that this decomposition is dominated as Sylvan explained. Okay? So, so this uh, big introduction of, of an example you may already know is because I wanted to explain the fact that here you have plenty of ways to decompose in this partial hyperbolicity, to obtain this decomposition into, into three different subbundles. So the, the one way to decompose is to choose Uh, by modulus of eigenvalues smaller than one, equal to one, and bigger than one. But this is by far not the only way. And sometimes it's useful to decompose this in different ways, to get different partial hyperbolicities. OK, so I forgot to remark, so if k is bigger or equal than 2, then a is uh, f is, is globally partially hyperbolic. Okay, so this, this is a, a well-known example. It's just a, a, an easy generalization of this example. Notice that also this example, if you take the identity on the circle, also belongs to this class of examples, because you can put a 1 over here. But now let me try to generalize these kind of examples to a, a, a really larger class of uh, algebraic dynamics. Well, so essentially, what you're doing here is you're taking, you're thinking, you can think this manifold, Rd, as a, as a group, as a Lie group, which has a, a, a product which is the, the usual sum of vectors, and this is an automorphism of this Lie group. Okay, so essentially, the, the key point of homogeneous dynamics which is essentially apparent here is that if you have a homogeneous manifold, that means that it's it looks the same in every point. And you have a, a, a map which preserves, in a certain sense, this homogeneous structure, then to check partial hyperbolicity, it's enough to check it in one point, because the rest of the points will behave exactly the same. And to, and to have partial hyperbolicity, it's enough to have two different eigenvalues, which seems not so hard. 
Okay? So in general, if you have she, a Lie group, and if you, if you don't know what this means, just think about the matrix uh, subgroup. So uh, uh, a set of matrices that is closed under multiplication. And you take gamma inside chi, a closed subgroup, such that chi by gamma is compact. Okay, so we are mainly interested in, in compact manifolds, okay? So, um, those. So we will require that uh, there's this Lie group that you, you take, it has a, a compact quotient by a subgroup. Okay, in general, the, the, the most classic examples, this subgroup is uh, just a, a discrete subgroup like CD in RD, but you can think that this uh, subgroup is uh, larger. It has positive dimension. For example, here we could quotient, if one of these bundles were invariant under CD, we could quotient by one of these bundles and it would be okay to take the quotient. Okay? So it's, uh, in RD, the subgroups are always of the form RK times CD uh, for something. Here, it might be more complicated. So I, I will give examples, but first let me uh, present the general construction. Um, and so the, the idea is uh, choose, and when I say choose, this is the difficult part in general, okay? Is uh, choose phi uh, um, an automorphism of chi such that it preserves this closed subgroup. This, in, in this setting, is just taking a matrix with integer coefficients and determinant equal to one, so that the matrix and its inverse preserves the group. And, and choose she in she, which will play the role of this translation. Okay? Notice here that when, when we took the derivative of, uh, of this function, which was an automorphism plus uh, translation, this translation didn't play any role here. However, when the, when the group is not abelian, then translating from one side on the, and translating from the other side, it might be different. So that translations in a Lie group may, may have non-trivial action as in the derivative. Okay, so uh, that said in, in kind of fancy words, the derivative, if, if you take the function, so I will start on the, on the other side. So if you take the function f equals uh, g times phi of x, which is exactly what we did here, then the derivative of f in the, in the identity will be isometric or essentially the same as what's called the adjoint representation of she times uh, the derivative of the automorphism phi, phi. Okay, so what we have to check to get partial hyperbolicity that is that this matrix is uh, partially hyperbolic. Okay, so if phi preserves the, the lattice or the subgroup gamma, then you have that f 
of x times gamma will be she times phi of x gamma. But since this is an automorphism and preserves gamma, this goes out, and you have this. Okay, so you can define f in this homogeneous space. And checking partial hyperbolicity here is equivalent to checking that this matrix has one eigenvalue of modulus different from one. Okay? So just to say a word about this, uh, this thing for those who don't know what this is. So essentially what you have is that in this Lie group, the, the small f is, is the, is this, uh, I'm, I'm writing like this, the points in she over gamma. So it's uh, the, the classes, it's like writing in TD, it's a point like x plus CD. Okay, and, and here I was just checking that this map preserves this, uh, these classes. Okay, so it descends to this quotient, which is compact by requirement. And so if this matrix, which was the derivative, I claim that this is the derivative, if it has an eigenvalue different from one, you have an example of a partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism. And so to, to explain a little bit why a translation may be partially hyperbolic, just notice that when you have a Lie group, you have uh, its Lie algebra she, which is the, the tangent space at the identity of the group. And then if you, have, if you pick an inner product here, you can translate it to every point of the group by, trans, by right translations. Okay? And so right translations become uh, isometries of the group. And that's why we quotient this group from the right. But when you act from the left, there's no reason to be an isometry. And essentially, this matrix measures how far from being an isometry you are. And it's, that's why this matrix may have eigenvalues different from one. OK, so we will do an example now. There are many examples in the, in the, in the notes, but we are choosing now only one. Example. It's also a very classical example, which is uh, the, the Shedesic or the frame flow. So let me do parallelly two, uh, two examples which are nice. Okay, so let she be one of these two groups, which this one is the, the isometry group of the hyperbolic plane, and this one is the isometry group of the hyperbolic space. Okay? And okay, you, you can think about this. This is our two by two matrices with determinant one, coefficients in R. This is quotienting by minus the identity. This is the same, but with complex uh, entries. And it's known, it's not, it's not trivial to, to prove, but it's, it's known that there exist uh, subgroups of Xi, which are Compact and discrete. Okay, this in this case, it's this is called the the uniformization theorem for surfaces for Riemann surfaces. So it says that if you have a surface of genus larger than one, then there exists a, a, a metric of curvature minus one, and when you lift this metric to the hyperbolic plane you get a subgroup of isometries 
which has compact quotient. Here, uh, the existence of co compact discrete uh, groups is much harder because constructing hyperbolic tree manifolds is something which is not so easy. But there are many theorems that uh, allow you to show that there exist hyperbolic tree manifolds, and so you can choose such a subgroup. Okay? And so now what we will do is we will forget about this automorphism part and just take a translation. Okay? So choose. We choose. AT to be the following matrix. And consider F and identity AT of x to be a t of x. OK, so this is one way to, to show that this is uh, exactly, OK, we obtain in uh, she over gamma the geodesic flow of the geodesic flow in the case PSL2R and uh, on PSL and the frame flow in the case PSL2C. Okay, so what, what's, what does this mean? So the, the, the thing to check which I, I, I don't have much time to do here, but it's explained in the notes, is that if you take any point in, in this group and you multiply by this one parameter subgroup, what you get in the projection to the hyperbolic plane or the hyperbolic three space are geodesics of, of these uh, manifolds. And so in the case of the hyperbolic two space, then this corresponds the isometry group. When you fix one point, you have all the directions to choose. And this corresponds to the geodesic flow. But when you go to hyperbolic three space, the stabilizer of one point is the, the, the set of frames in one point. Okay, so you have a, the manifold here. And if you look at the isometries of the hyperbolic tree space that fix this point x, you get not only the tangent vectors, but also a perpendicular vector to choose. And when you act by this uh, one parameter subgroup, you are moving this frame by parallel transportation. So this was to, uh, to have a, a relationship because I, I said algebraic geometric constructions and by this uh, you can you can see this construction as geometric if you take M a manifold Riemannian manifold of negative curvature then a time one map of the geodesic flow on the frame flow are partially, globally, partially capable. Okay, this is also a classical result. 
Okay, so this is it about uh, algebraic or geometric examples. And now let me speak a little bit more about uh, examples that arise inside the, the field of partially hyperbolic dynamics. So once, once you have each one of these examples, algebraic or not, you can make products or even skew products, which is something I will explain in the, in the afternoon. But there are also another ways to obtain uh, new examples of partially hyperbolic system by different methods. Okay? So the, the first one, which I won't speak uh, a lot about, is uh, surgery. Okay, this, this uh, is a, a very general uh, type of construction, but we don't know how to perform it in, in many cases. Okay, so this is well known to work for an awesome flows. This we have not defined, so an anosov flow it is an flow if phi1 is globally partially hyperbolic with with one dimensional center. Okay, so when you have an anosov flow on a manifold then sometimes it is possible to cut this manifold along a, a certain submanifold. So you have an anosov flow in M. And you can sometimes cut this manifold along by, by a certain submanifold, a torus, for example. And then you can glue another manifold here or glue the same thing you have cut in a different way and obtain a new flow in a new manifold, okay? So this surgery allows to change the manifold but keep partial hyperbolicity. However, this, this is a mechanism we don't know very much uh, beyond the realm of uh, anosov flows. And since I don't have, I, I want to explain another thing. So let me point to two papers which are quite really quite easy to read and provide a, a very nice example of this surgery construction. One is a, is a, a very old paper by Franks and Williams, which you, uh, you can look at. It's a, a short paper, and essentially you can follow the arguments by looking at the, at the drawings, which are very nice, but they, they take some time. And then there's a, another kind of surgery construction, which was performed later by Handel and Thurston. There are other examples, but this one is particularly easy, and it, it applies the cone field criteria that uh, that Sylvain explained yesterday to, to show that the flow, once you glue again the manifold, is still partially is still a, an anosov flow. Okay, but so in the time I have, I will try to explain the, the last. Uh, mechanism to construct examples of partially hyperbolic system. Okay, so yesterday Sylvain explained 
why uh, the set of partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism is an open set in the C1 topology. Okay, so the, the idea So essentially what he showed that you have a globally partially hyperbolic system, if you like, so they, then you have a cone field which is preserved by the derivative. And so if you make a C1 perturbation of uh, your partially hyperbolic system, then the derivative is very close to the original one. And so if the cone fields were sent to ins inside it themselves, this C1 perturbation will still preserve these cone fields. Okay, but essentially this is one way to guarantee the preservation of the cone fields. So one could imagine that one can compose by any diffeomorphism which preserves the cone field and still get partial hyperbolicity. So for the moment, we know essentially two, uh, two types of way to guarantee this cone field preservation. So tr I will try to explain in detail an example did to Manier, and if I have some time, I, I will explain the other one. Okay, so I have to write the matrix. So we will start. Okay, so the, the, the idea here is to start with a partially, globally partially hyperbolic system. In fact, it will be an OSO. It will have a, all eigenvalues different from one. And we will compose it with a new diffeomorphism and still get uh, partial hyperbolicity, but changing some of the behavior of the dynamics. For example, changing uh, the index of a periodic orbit. Okay? So we start with some uh, partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism F of the torus uh, with eigenvalues 0 more than lambda 1 and lambda 2 more than 1 more than lambda 3. So Sylvan found an example. This one. is uh, that's, that's the shove. And so what we have here is a linear, if in, the, in R3, we have a linear uh, map of the torus. So let's, let's look at what happens in a neighborhood of zero, which is a fixed point of this. So choose a chart. For example, uh, of this form, where uh, x, y, z maps to and the one x okay, so we have the torus here. We have the zero, which the, the point for which zero projects, which is in the middle, and we choose a small chart here, and we linearize. We it's it's just diagonalizing this matrix, and then uh, renormalizing so that we are in this uh, neighborhood. So don't, don't confuse. This is not the coordinates in R three. It's just a chart we are putting around zero, and so we have this. Uh, we can look the dynamics this way. Okay, so now the, the idea is to change. So choose a function she from minus one, one to R such that she x, y, c equals uh, lambda 2, y in a neighborhood of the boundary of minus 1, 1 to the 3. And secondly, 
we will ask that the derivative of this function with respect to y is between these two other numbers. Okay, so the, the idea is to change what happens in the y direction by this new function, okay, which is gluing well in the boundary. But now we will choose something here in the middle, which is more or less arbitrary, except that we require this function to be dominated by these two values. Okay, so this derivative belongs to lambda 1 plus epsilon lambda 3 minus epsilon. It's separated from the values here. And so we consider f. Let me, I, I will use a parameter because it's easier to show partial hyperbolicity. f uh, a gives y cell, which is equal to f a outside the chart. And equal to lambda one x she of write it like this a a smaller than one a she of x a minus one y c and lambda three of c. Okay, so we are keeping what happens outside this uh, chart and we are changing inside the chart by this new function. Okay? This here, what says is a minus one y and a here. Okay, this is this is just technical to, to prove partial hyperbolicity. That what you have to think about is the following. So you have the chart here. And you have the function she you have defined. But for technical reasons, what you will do is you define not she, but you will try to make the deformation only in a small band here, changing with a, and then renormalizing this. OK, so it's, it's just a trick. OK, so you, if you want to think that I'm putting here she only. But now to show that there are confields, it's easier if I do this. Okay. No, no, no big deal. So let me show partial hyperbolicity. So we have to show the existence of cone fields. And so let me write the derivative of f. Okay, so d f a looks like this. Well, it looks the same outside the neighborhood. And inside the chart, it looks like this. Lambda 1, 0, 0. Here, when you derivate this by x, you get a times the derivative of she with respect to x. When you derivate with respect to y, so this a and a minus 1 cancel. OK, so you get she y. And when you derivate, derivate with respect to c, you get a times she of c. So, why did I put this? So that I can choose these two derivatives to be very small. Okay, so that this is more or less diagonal. Okay? And here I have lambda 3, 0, and 0. Okay? And so the, the point is that if A is small, then we will find cone fields around each uh, vector. So let me write the cone field. So for B equal BX, BY, BC, well, we will find cone.
So we have this, and we will choose the cone field to be, see, it's, uh, say, dx uh, smaller. And this is, this is the final cone field. I, I will choose alpha right away. So what, what you get when you do dFA of b, you get dx prime, dy prime, dz prime. And what you have is that dx prime equals lambda 1 dx. And what happens if you look at these two, the sum of these two? So so you have to multiply by this. So you only get this matrix. And since A is very, very small, you can choose A very, very small, you can assume that you are multiplying by chi y and lambda 3 each one of the vectors. So you take the smallest one of them, which is this one, but which is still larger than lambda 1. Okay, so it's larger or equal that than uh, lambda 1 plus epsilon. Okay, and so this if this was larger, if this was smaller, this is still smaller. Okay? And you get the contraction of the cone field. And you can do the same by inverting c and x plus y. And you get the other cone field. And you show that this uh, example we have constructed for a very small is partially hyperbolic. So let me make some comments about the function she, what, what can it make? So I, I, I will come back to this in the afternoon because we will make another examples with this idea. But essentially, it's, it's, you may have seen what are Anosov derivatives. So essentially, if you take chi, the original chi, lambda 2 times a, a y, is the following function. Here's y. Here's the diagonal. And the, the original function was like this. This is lambda 2. But now, she is allowed to change this for the fixed point zero the way we want. So for example, we can do something like this. And create a repelling fixed point around zero. Okay, so this has the following uh, <coughs> drawing. So originally we had, I'm drawing the stable manifold of the linear map here, and it had here one eigenvalue lambda 1, here the weak eigenvalue lambda 2. But after we do the perturbation, we get the following drawing. So this is uh, something to remark. So notice that the lines of the form uh, something uh, zero y uh, zero here are preserved. Okay, so so this still preserves the the vertical foliation like this. But now, when you look at the fixed point here. It's no longer attracting. Now it's repelling. 
and it has this loop. Of course, when you have this, you have to create new fixed points. These appear over here, and they are attracting. And the new uh, stable manifold now modifies. Notice that the, the direction of the stable manifold, which was asterisk zero, zero, now it changes because it gains some, some coordinate here. Even if there is a stable manifold, because of the confield criterion, the, the direction might change. And so the drawing is something like this. I have seen this drawing. So in the, in the exercise session, the, one of the proposals will be to start with any uh, linear anosov on any torus and try to make this kind of construction to play with the, the partially hyperbolic splitting. Okay, if you have this, here we have not uh, we, we still have the same uh, decomposition, okay? So for this one, we have the decomposition T of T3 equal ES plus EC, e, 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 strong, stable, stable, and unstable. And we, what we have done is to change this stable direction to a neutral one. It's a cent now it's, it's still an invariant direction, it's a central direction, but it's no longer stable. It has points where it expands, okay? So the same you can do to, for example, to break a domination. If instead of changing only, only this coordinate, you change these two coordinates and you create a complex eigenvalue, for example, then you won't have the splitting, this splitting anymore. And you can kill this kind of thing. So uh, I will explain this in the afternoon, but it's also part of the exercises uh, for this, for the tutorial session. Okay. So since I have some minutes, I, I will explain another uh, way of uh, creating partially hyperbolic examples. which is the same spirit as this, in the sense that what we need is to try to preserve some cone fields. Okay, so other examples. Okay, and this is uh, a construction which is uh, showing with Christian Bonatti. And so the, the idea is very similar to this. So suppose F from M to M is partially hyperbolic. And we're splitting the M. Yes, plus EC plus EU. And assume there exists H M to M diffeomorphism such that the derivative of H applied to the bundle EU is transverse to the bundle ECS, ES plus EC. And the derivative of H 
applied to the bundle ES is transverse to EC plus EU. And so the proposition is a, almost an exercise is there exists N such that <coughs> Fn composed with H is partially hyperbolic. Okay, and so the, the proof of this is very simple. Essentially, what you have is that the unstable direction is mapped by, F, by H transverse to the center stable. So as you apply F many times, you get that the unstable direction come back to the same position. And so, so take CU, C, uh, unstable form field, so that dh of cu is transverse to es plus ec. You can do this because you can always choose the cone field as narrow as you want. And so uh, as you apply dh, you, you get something which is still transverse to ecs. So for large n, Fn of uh, dh of cu is contained in cu. And so you get the cone field criteria, okay? So why, why is this proposition interesting? And, uh, and it's the same spirit as, as this construction. You can look this construction as making a composition by something which preserves the cone fields. Okay? And the, the interest of this uh, proposition is that now you, you can more or less expect H to be whatever you want. All you need is to have a little bit of control of which are these bundles, and maybe you can construct a, a diffeomorphism here which is not isotopic to the identity. Okay? So this uh, proposition, we used it here to construct examples starting from an anosov flow and making something which is not isotopic to the identity. So let me explain only one example which I can maybe say in one minute, which is consider the geodesic flow in, in a surface. But I will start changing the surface so that it has a very, very short geodesic in the middle. Okay? So the idea is that if, if you take this tube very, very large in curvature minus one, then if you perform here, a dent twist for those who know, which turns, you, you cut this, you turn it, and you glue it again. So the, the, the hyperbolic matrix are very close to each other. Okay? So the, let's call the dent twist here a function rho of the surface. So n is the length of this tube. And so as you do the dent twist, this then twist is, uh, ver verifies that the distance, the infinity distance, if you want, of the metric rho n, she n, and she n, where she n is the Riemannian metric here, this goes to zero. But then the, this uh, then twist induces a conjugacy between the geodesic flows of this metric and this metric. Okay. 
and conjugating by a diffeomorphism sends stable and unstable directions into stable and unstable directions. And so when you apply this conjugacy, you will get this condition, but the function rho is not isotopic to identity. And so you get a new example of partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism, which at this moment we, we don't understand very well. Okay? And so that's it for the morning. Thank you.